welcome everyone to the second session of this morning and the speaker is Rawad Mezer. He's going to talk about pseudo-randomness and graphs. Uh, it is. Uh, it is. It is on. No. Technical difficulties. Oh yeah, cool. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rawad, and so first of all, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for this nice conference and this great initiative. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And second of all, I would like to talk to you today about uh, some work I've been doing on quantum pseudo randomness and applications to quantum uh, advantage experiments. So. Starting off, I'm going to introduce the main paradigm of quantum computing which I'll be using, which is basically the measurement-based quantum computing. Then I will define how to generate uh, random unities in this uh, formalism. After that, I will describe the main objects of study here, which are the unitarity designs. And then I'll go on to some work done in that uh, perspective and some ongoing and future work. Right. So basically, measurement-based quantum computing is a form of uh, quantum computing which uses multipartite entangled states, which are called graph states. Now, a graph state is, uh, a like I said, it's a highly entangled uh, multipartite state, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a graph. And basically, the vertices of the graph are the qubits, and the edges are preparation entanglements. And so if your uh, graph state is a universal resource for quantum computing, then using some measurements and some corrective strategy on this graph state, you can in principle implement any unitary which you want on your unmeasured output. So an example of the most commonly used uh, measurement-based quantum computing resource is the cluster state. Now it has the shape of a lattice. Now as you can see here, like a subset of the qubits is defined as the input with input state psi in, which we imprint on it. And all the other non-input qubits are defined as in the plus state. And so Sorry. So basically what we do is that uh, we prepare preparation entanglements, which are these horizontal and vertical lines, in order to create this lattice state. Right. So uh, like I said, you can in principle implement any unitary if you perform your measurements and if you have some sort of corrective strategy. But in our case, we're not interested in correcting for the measurements because we want our unitaries to be implemented at random. And in particular, we want to show that these random unitaries uh, sample from something which mimics genuine Haar randomness efficiently. Basically, it's a T design, it's called. I'll introduce it in the mm, coming slides. Um, so this is an example of how to generate a random unitary using uh, an MBQC on a two qubit cluster state. So basically, this means that the input is qubit, and this is the sorry, <laughs> uh, this is the unmeasured output qubit. So here what I do is that I measure uh, the input qubit at an angle alpha in the xy plane, right? And so this measurement will project uh, this qubit randomly onto, with probability one half, onto either the state plus alpha or the state minus alpha. And this now effectively means that the, the either this unitary, Hadamard mart times z rotation with angle alpha, or Hadamard mart times z rotation with angle pi times z rotation with angle alpha, is applied to the initial input state, which is now teleported to the output position. So what you need to know is that basically doing this and not correcting, like not post-selecting on your measurement result, would effectively randomly apply uh, this unitary, where m is a binary, which is applied randomly with probability one half on your unmeasured output. So the same idea applied to larger graph is the resource of the uh, random unitaries which we use in our work. Right. So what are the objects that we are interested in studying? They are basically called unitary T designs, and they are ensembles of unitaries, sets of unitaries, along with a probability distribution over these sets. And what these do is that they mimic genuine Haar randomness up to teeth order statistical moments. Uh, right, and so they have many, so Haar randomness 
um, I I think uh, is is inefficient to generate in general. It's you cannot generate it with some efficient process, but these unitary T designs you can generate them very uh, efficiently in polynomial time. So they are useful in thermodynamic equilibration. They are useful for randomized benchmarking for modeling the dynamics of black holes, and like recently, uh, their use has been uh, so these uh, unitary T designs they satisfy a property which is called anti concentration. And this basically means that the output probabilities of them are not too peaked. And this is uh, important in reducing the number of complexity theoretic conjectures and quantum advantage proofs and architectures for quantum advantage uh, to two. Um, and so these have uses in some quantum advantage proofs and many other applications as well. So going on to a formal definition of a T-design, like I said, it's a set of unitaries and the probability distribution over it. And what we're interested in is how close this is to hard, uh, unit, hard distributed unitaries. So an exact design basically satisfies this property where this is the probability over of choosing unitary U, and this is the default tensor product expander. This is the conjugate, and this is any uh, density matrix here. And this is the Haar measure, so this is averaging with respect to the Haar measure. And this is called an exact T design. But we're more interested in, in our work in uh, implementing epsilon approximate T designs, which are basically ensembles of random unities which mimic up to precision epsilon choosing from the Haar measure. So these can be defined using various norms, and each of these norms is relevant to the application which we are using. But the main idea behind all the definitions is closeness to the Haar measure again. So this is a part. <coughs> Sorry, this is a particular definition. Uh, so when epsilon equals to zero, so this is the precision of mimicking if you want. When epsilon is equal to zero, we recover this above definition. And this less than or equal means for matrices that uh, if A less than equal B, then B minus A is positive semi-definite. Right. So this is like an intuitive picture of what a T design does, like a uh, very rough, let's say, picture of what it does. So basically, you input your state for a given application, and you apply to it a unitary sampled from a T design, and you're allowed to use less than or equal to T copies, and the output state which you obtain with, with the T design acting on it uh, is, hard, is basically indistinguishable, practically, from a hard sampled one. And like I said, the main interest of these things is that these can be done efficiently in polynomial time, where genuine hard randomness cannot be done so in that way. Right. <coughs> so uh, the main focus here is to generate, like I said, uh, unitary T designs on graph states, on particular types of graph states, cluster-like states. They're basically called brickwork states, the ones which we use, at fixed angles. And these are for practical considerations in mind. And uh, so what was previous research done in this area? So Damien and Peter Turner, they showed that you can do this efficiently on a graph state. But the graph state they use is extremely uh, is, has an extremely complicated structure, so it's not uh, very uh, it it's not likely to be generated by the current technologies, and mainly because you use some uh, like so, so ma mainly because what they do is that they actually mimic directly the uh, local random circuit construction of Prando et al. And uh, to do this on a MBQC requires uh, some sort of operations which are very hard to do, X fusions, which occur with some success probability. Right. So what we show is that you don't need these X fusions and you don't need this complicated graph. Basically what you need is a lattice graph, a brickwork state, with fixed XY angles where you're, you have only three choices of measurement angles which you use. And for an efficient size of this graph, this effectively performs uh, an epsilon approximate T design. Right, so these are the main things I'm going to talk about, the main results of uh, this thing. So like I said, a brickwork gadget, uh, which means an MBQC with measurement angles on it, effectively uh, with n rows, and m is a polynomial in n, the number of input qubits, and t, the order of the design, and epsilon, the error of the mimicking, Columns is an epsilon approximate T design for fixed XY plane measurements. So you can find this on, I've just put here the archive link. And the second result is still in preparation. Uh, so as an application to this above mentioned graph gadget, we can show that sampling from the output probability distribution of it is hard to do classically given some uh, the usual complexity theoretic conjectures. So here it's like nothing uh, technically new in terms of the proof. It's the standard hardness proof, but I'll like explain later how this goes. And as a third 
uh, result we have here. So basically, we were thinking of uh, finding uh, some motivation for average case conjectures in, uh, in, in this uh, thing. And what we found was a sort of encoding from circuits to braids. And using this encoding, we managed to show that braids of polynomial length and uh, the number of strands, uh, which is basically in the braid group, you have like n strands. That's what uh, its braid is formed of n strands. So for something which is for uh, braids, which are formed of compositions of the group generator of polynomial length in these strands, uh, approximating their uh, approximating up to relative error these uh, things is uh, Sharpie hard. And so, uh, first of all, let's start with defining how our graph picture works. So like I said, you have this sort of lattice gadget, this brickwork graph state, uh, which is the precursor. It's two qubit, and you only have three measurement settings, pi by four, zero, and pi by two. And you stick them together in this way. So this means that this is this, and here, this means that the output of the second qubit here is attached to the input of the third. And here it means that there's no vertical entanglement between them. And we call this graph gadget Gn. And then we stick together copies of Gn, k, n, t, epsilon times. And this is basically called concatenation in measurement-based quantum computing. What you do is that you identify the output of graph i minus one as the input of graph i, right? And so for k and t epsilon is an efficient polynomial in the order t, uh, in, in n, in t, and in log of one over epsilon and log of t, then it applies to the n output qubits, a random unitary, which is an epsilon approximate t design. Like I said, uh, we don't measure the n output qubits, and the random unitary we obtain at the end, uh, in the same sense as I uh, explained in the example, here, for this particular length and for this particular graph, which I showed you, is a unitary sampled from an epsilon approximate t design. So how does the proof go for this? Like, what is the intuition behind these things? So basically, when you want to prove such stuff about t designs, uh, we use basically uh, something which is a reduced version of a t design, a precursor of a t design, which is called an eta t tensor product expander. Now, there is a theorem which says that if you can prove that it's an eta t tensor product expander, then iterating it an efficient number of times would give you a t design. So first off, to prove that it's an eta t uh, tensor product expander with the properties that we need, we start by proving that, this, that B, this two qubit block I showed you, is universal on U4 and also contains inverses. So we do this using an old method uh, derived by Lloyd and by Dutch independently in the 90s. Uh, after doing that, we we sh you, we can connect because because this is universal and because this contains inverses we can connect it to a particular type of many body hamiltonian which is called the uh, glrc hamiltonian now this is the same hamiltonian which was used in the original work of brando and haro and horodeki uh, so this is a Hamiltonian of a known spectral gap, and its spectral gap is polynomial in the number of qubits relevant to our case. Um, and you use this lemma, which is called the detectability lemma, because we're using a quantum random circuit, which is similar to the works of Brando et al., but it's not exactly it. But uh, the, the, like, it's something which is fixed. In, the, in those works, what you do is that at each time, you either randomly choose uh, your rows and apply to them. But in our case, everything is fixed, like as you notice. Like, there is no randomness in the choice of rows. We're just sticking together copies of a fixed graph. But like these proof techniques follow the same way. And so using these two things and using this theorem, which I told you about iterating a tensor product expander some certain number of times, uh, we get that En is an epsilon approximate t design. So I haven't included more details here, but I'd be happy to discuss if anyone is interested. Right. So as an application to the above mentioned uh, thing, this graph gadget En, so this is the same En, which is the, the k and t epsilon copies. Uh, what we do now is that, like I said, we have measurements on everything but the output qubits, and now we measure the output qubits in the Z basis. And we're studying the probability distribution of measurement results of all these qubits. We take these two conjectures into consideration. We suppose that the polynomial hierarchy does not collapse to its third level. Now, this is something which is usually, uh, uh, so this is usually standard and widely believed to be true. And the second thing we say, we take some sort of average case conjecture, which says that it's sharply hard to approximate uh, up to relative error on a fraction of outputs, the probability distribution. Instead of, so we know that because gadgets such, a, such like this are universal under post-selection, then this is worst case sharply hard problem. But 
to extend it to the average case, uh, we need to, to do a certain conjecture, basically. There is no proof uh, for it in terms of approximation yet. Right, and so the theorem we have is that assuming these conjectures above are true, then the graph gadget which I showed you, sampling from the probability distribution of it, uh, is hard to do classically. So it cannot be done uh, in polynomial time up to this uh, particular error. Right. So like I said, the proof is nothing new, technically. It's very, uh, it's like, it's, it's very standard. These methods have already been done, like by, for example, Juani and the audience. Um, and so, it starts by supposing that there exists a polynomial time classical algorithm which can sample up to error 1 over 22 in the L1 norm. And you input three things. You, you say that P, the probabilities of it, are worst case sharply hard to approximate, and that's because, like I said, the gadget is universal under post-selection. You use Stockmeyer's theorem, and you use the anti-concentration property of the design. Now, in some proofs of quantum advantage, this thing is taken as conjecture. But because we have T designs, and people showed that this is provably anti-concentrates, we don't need to take it as conjecture. Right. And so from this, you get you, you transform from a sampling problem onto an approximation problem. So basically what you have now is an algorithm in the third level of the polynomial hierarchy, which is approximating these output probabilities Px up to a given relative error. Now what you need to do is that you need to use Toda's theorem and you use the conjecture too, and you get that Sharpie hard problem is solved by an algorithm in the third level. And this means that the uh, polynomial hierarchy has collapsed to the third level. Using conjecture one, which says that this is highly improbable, then you get a contradiction. And so what you began with is wrong, and you can't do this. You can't sample classically. Right. So in the final uh, part of this, what I, what, like I said, I was trying to find the motivation for the average case hardness. And so I, uh, we tried looking at linking the problem to the Jones polynomial. So we used the particular encoding uh, by Kitaev et al, it is known, to go from uh, circuits to uh, braids efficiently. But the additional thing we imposed is that your random circuits are anti-concentrating. And what we got is that if this anti-concentration is satisfied, then suppose you have an algorithm in the third level, which is approximating up to relative error gamma uh, for a fraction of unitaries, like I said, and associated outputs. If it's approximating the prob output probability, then it is also approximating up to relative error sigma plus gamma, the output probability over the random braids associated to these circuits. Now using this, and using the fact that under post-selection these are universal, which means that these are worst case sharpie hard, and using anti-concentration, you get this nice corollary, which says that, uh, and as well as the Solovey-Kitaev theorem, which says that this, uh, the problem of approximating braids of polynomial number of strands is sharpie hard, uh, approximating in the relative other sense. So this is confirming a conjecture which is placed here. Uh, Right, and so this thing, the nice thing about this previous theorem which I showed you here is that it works for circuits, so you can justify average case hardness for circuits with gates which are not necessarily commuting, right? Because, uh, for example, in IQP, instantaneous quantum computing, what you do is that you relate, relate the problem to to Ising Hamiltonians, and, uh, and you argue that it is hard to <laughs> approximate the partition function over these Hamiltonians in average case. But these only work for circuits which are uh, diagonal in the same basis. And but, the, but this thing works for like more than that. It works for circuits which are not necessarily commuting. Um, so in summary, so we found a simple graph gadget which forms an epsilon approximate T design. We showed that sampling associated to the above uh, gadget is uh, classically intractable. And we found through an encoding from circuits to braids that uh, these uh, have, uh, that the braids have uh, worst case Sharpie hard to approximate up to relative error output probabilities for polynomial length. So ongoing and future work. What I've am being interested now is in performing these T designs in graphs with no corrective strategy. It means that you cannot uh, get a deterministic unitary applied to the output, but nevertheless, which are information preserving. It means that you get unitaries. So basically, when you measure and you don't correct in this case, you get a set of unitaries, but these unitaries cannot be linked by polys. And arguably, these should be s more spread inside the unitary group, which means that they should be f uh, form faster designs. 
The second thing is the robust verified sampling of our graph state architecture. So I have a bit of an idea here how to proceed uh, in terms of the robustness. So because this is an IQP, and for a particular noise model, there's this paper by Ashley Montanaro, and uh, okay, I forgot who the second author was, uh, which shows that uh, you can, like using a bigger IQP, you can basically uh, account for a constant amount of noise applies to each output qubit. And as well as I would like maybe to look at applications of T-designs in thermodynamic equilibration and in black holes. And as well as, uh, so I want to I ask the question, so here I have partial results here. So I ask the question of whether the uh, three angle choices I showed you, 0 pi by 4 pi by 2, are necessary, like are the only, uh, are all the only necessary choices. And in fact, uh, because I believe that most unities are universal for quantum computing and that a random, uh, probability distribution will eventually converge to the Haar measure over a universal set, that this restriction should not be the case, that indeed almost all XY angles should work. And finally, thank you for your attention. Mm, questions? Uh, thank you for the very in interesting talk. Uh, I actually have a question concerning your last point. So, as far as I remember in the original result by Bandao, Hodetsky, and Harrow, uh, basically it's, it doesn't matter uh, which universal gate set you pick on the two qubit gates, right? That, that you then concatenate to. And then uh, you mentioned that you computed spectral gap. Of, uh, so, were you able to compute the spectral gap for uh, the specific unitaries that are sort of encoded by the choice of angles that you... Uh, that's a very interesting question. Well, in fact, uh, it is so it is not computable in general for any particular universal gate set. Mm -hmm. But if you choose... Uh, if you choose it to contain inverses, and if you choose it to be universal, then you can use uh, this result, uh, which says that you can efficiently compute it like uh, it's it's equal to the GLRC gap of Brando, but multiplied by a constant factor. So you can do it only in the case where you have uh, inverses and where it is universal. And that's why we use this particular measurement choice of angles, because those gives me sets of unities which are universal and which are inverse containing. OK, in interesting. Can, can can I have one more, one more question? Yeah. So, uh, this measurement based uh, computation, you do projective measurements? Yes. Right? Yes. So, what if you had, is there a chance that things would improve if you use different measurements than projective? Um, like different mm, instruments? Yeah, like that's, uh, so I haven't actually really thought of that, but that, that would be an interesting thing to pursue. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, about the hardness of simulate uh, simulation of Jones polynomials, yes. for which roots of unity you can show this um, so hardness? So, basically, for k equal five or k greater than or equal to seven, anything oh. non-principal. More questions? Yes. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so, I, first of all, a so quick comment on Michal's second question. I would have thought that um, implementing sort of this Neymar construction um, in an MBQC setting is only sort of polynomial time overhead so that you don't get any improvement in complexity like you know, computational power by going to pure VMs, but I might miss something. Um, but the, the actual question is a very, very stupid question. So if you integrate over the all unitaries, the, over the whole unitary group, then isn't that always the randomizing channel? So like that takes any input to the maximum mix state? Yeah, indeed. So uh, uh, locally, yeah. So like if you if you apply a unitary to your uh, or to your to your any state then it is then a hard unitary to your state then with high probability it is uh, it is uh, very highly entangled which means that locally it looks like a maximally mixed state yes so searching for t unitary designs is sort of 
synonymous with looking for sub sets of unitaries that are very small, like much smaller than the dimensional system, that have exactly this effect, no? Like that, that reproduce this effect. Indeed, that's, that's the motivation behind T-designs, okay. like you're studying the evenness of distribution inside the unitary group. But the point is that the set, is the cardinality of the set is much, much smaller than the, like log, the size of the uh, yeah. So space there are Yeah, so there yeah. are like results now, uh, like, uh, so th this hasn't been proven, but it's been proven recently that you can get designs in like logarithmic depth. Yeah. In log of logarithmic depth, actually. Yeah. Okay, so this well. is a very interesting question and uh, relevant to uh, uh, black hole physics, where you want you you want your uh, like you want the information on the surface of the black hole to equilibrate in log depth. That is what is believed to be true. And so there is this paper which I so. Oh, I thought okay, it's it's off for me. So there's this paper here which says that the T-design should be able to be implementable in log depth if this uh, theorem about like black holes should be true. And that's been like a very interesting question in the field for like quite some time, but it was recently solved. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Okay, so let's thank Rawad again.